Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is titled a methodology to evaluate the effects of kinematic measurement uncertainties on knee ligament properties estimated from laxity measurements. My name is Christopher Iverson and I work here at Anybody Technology. Today I will be the host of this webinar and I will be joined by my colleague Björn Keller Ingelund, who is one of the engineers here at Anybody Technology. And Björn will help us out during the Q&A session and help out with answering of your questions. In today's webcast, our speaker is Associate Professor Michael Skipper Anderson, and Michael is working at the Department of Materials and Production at Aalborg University here in Denmark. He's going to give his presentation in a minute or so, but just before we start, I will give you a general introduction and overview of the Anybody Modeling System, for those of you who is unfamiliar with the software or musculoskeletal modeling in general. So what is the Anybody Modeling System? Well, the Anybody Modeling System is a software that allows you to do musculoskeletal modeling and simulation. As input, it takes motion data as kinematics and forces, and it calculates the internal body load as joint moments, joint reaction forces, and muscle forces. And here in the bottom of the screen, you can see a screenshot from the Anybody Modeling software, which can give you an idea of how the system actually looks. At the moment, anybody is used in a wide variety of areas and applications. And a few examples of this is movement analysis, product optimization design, the field of sports optimization, orthopedics and rehabilitation, and assistive devices as, for example, exoskeletons. And the typical workflow in anybody could look something like this. So you provide the recorded motion data as input and use the body models which you or others have built and then you provide some kind of environment, which could be, for example, an exoskeleton. Then you can use anybody to combine these things, solve the muscle recruitment, and run the inverse dynamic simulations, which basically means that we go from motion to calculate the internal body loads and the inter interaction with the environment in some cases. Then we get a simulation that looks something like this. We can then output the results and use it for some kind of post-processing, which for example, could be a finite element tool. But many users also closes the loop completely by doing some kind of design optimization and then run this cycle multiple times. I think this brings me to the end of the introduction and I will hand over the word and present the role to Michael instead. Cool, yeah. but uh, thank you very much, uh, Christopher, for inviting me to give this, uh, give this webcast today. And you already introduced the title of the uh, of the talk, so I'll just skip to my to my next slide. So let me just get a pointer. So uh, ligaments they play an important role in maintaining knee joint stability and functionality. And just for the ones of you in the audience who are not knee experts, so the knee overall contains four bones: so the femur, the tibia, fibula, and the patella. And today we will focus primarily on the tib uh, yeah, tibia femoral joint, so the bone and the joint between femur and tibia. And the major ligaments we have to control this joint are the major four ligaments, which are the lateral collateral ligament and the medial collateral ligament, the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament. And these are the major ligaments for controlling the stability of the joint in combination with the shape of the bones and the meniscus. It has been shown multiple times that these the ligament parameters, so the mechanical properties of these ligaments, they vary at, between subjects. And this has primarily been measured in dissections of cadavers. So dissection out of the, the ligaments and then doing mechanical tests on the ligaments. And the reason for this is that there's no way to assess ligament properties directly in vivo, non-invasive. Um, so this is what I will talk about today. So what is the consequence of actually trying to assess them in vivo and what is the effect on them? Um, joint instability is a major problem. So there are two major areas where joint instability occur and plays a big role. So for instance, ligament injuries. So if you injure your anterior cruciate ligament or one of the other ligaments, the joint becomes instable and this has an effect on the functionality of the joint and it can lead to a decreased quality of life. In terms of joint replacement, instability is actually also a major concern, so as treatment for knee osteophritis. And the major reason for why people have to get a revision surgery within two years of the primary joint replacement is instability. 
And this, these two major areas is why we want to understand better what are the mechanical properties of ligaments and what is the role of them in terms of how do we reconstruct them in terms of the ligament injuries or in terms of joint replacements, how do we balance the knee better so we can avoid these instability issues. One way to start and get some information about the, on a better understanding of the mechanics of the joint is to create joint models, for instance, computational knee models. And I've just shown two examples, there are many other around in the literature. So the one you see here on the left is one of a total joint replacement that was created by Mara some, some years ago. And it's a model that has the bones, the muscles, ligaments, and the contacting surfaces. And with models like this, you can then compute the internal joint kinematics. You can compute muscle loads, joint loads, and ligament loads. But one of the requirements for building models like these is that you know the mechanical properties of the ligament. So we need to provide as input what is the stiffness of each individual ligament bundle, and we need to provide what is the slack length. So at what length does the ligament try to start to take up force? Um, there are also other models of kind of intact knees that we can use to simulate what is the effect on um, if you get a ligament injury, but these models require the same kind of uh, parameters. And one application that we are working towards at the moment is to use models like these for preoperative planning of surgery. And the idea is that you use a, a measurement device to kind of to assess the laxity of the joint. So which is a, a description of what is the, how stable is the joint. Um, and we have developed, developed this new device you see over here, which can actually assess the full 3D laxity profile of a knee joint. We take a laxity measurement like this and then combine them with medical imaging. Then we can create a kind of muscular skeletal model of this subject specific knee joint, where we use the medical images to obtain all the geometry, so the bone geometries, the meniscus geometry, and the, the origin and insertion points of ligaments. But then we still need to identify what are the mechanical properties of the ligaments, and this we then use laxity tests. Once we have that, we can use this model to then assess what happens if we do specific surgeries on this model. So one example could be that we do a total knee replacement on this computational model here, and then we use the model to predict what is then the expected laxity profile, or what is the expected stability of this joint afterwards. So we could, on the model after the surgery, we could do, for instance, anterior, posterior laxity test or internal, external rotation laxity test or whatever other laxity we are interested in. So the step I would like to talk, to about, talk to about today is this step here. If we have some laxity measurements, how can we then transform them into some information about what are the mechanical properties of the ligaments? And one way to do this is that we start by doing laxity tests. And the most common ones you'll find in the literature are the ones that the um, doctors are doing for diagnosis is they do a, an anterior and posterior bowl, they do varus valgus loading, and then do internal external rotation. And they do that at different knee angles. I just illustrated it here at full extension. And then out of this, we want to be able to measure how much did the knee move under the specific load case that we applied. And we also need to know what is the load that we applied in this case. Once we have that, we can then do like an inverse identification process with optimization, where we create a model of the knee joint that matches the subject. We put in the ligament geometry, and then we vary the ligament parameters, so the stiffness and slack length, in a loop until the model predicts the same laxity profile as we measured on the subject. And then out of this, we have some estimates on what are the mechanical properties of the ligament, in the model that then gets us as close as possible to what we have measured. And we then take those as these must be the, lax, uh, the mechanical properties representing this one subject. However, there is an issue with when we want to observe the movement of the bones. And the, the, the most accurate way to do this is either to do with x-rays, so try and do biplanar x-rays to, to identify where are the bones in space, or if you want to accept an in kind of invasive approach, which has been done in the cadaver studies, is to use bone pins and then track the markers on the bone pins with cameras. 
But this is associated with some degree of error and then uncertainties in, in the measurement. And there's been a couple of recent studies. So there's a study here by Peters and Nadal who used biplanar X-rays. And then they found error magnitudes in terms of the tibia femoral translations and rotations of two millimeters for translation, about one degree for rotations. There's been a, another, another study by Stens Olsen, 2017, who did it on, with RSA, so dynamic X-rays as well. Um, and they found about one millimeter translational error and one degree rotational error. Um, if you look at bone pins, there has been a, a study on the Vicon system where they found that the error on just reconstructing one point in space is around 0 0.35 millimeters just for a single point. They didn't transform that into what is the error in terms of full joint kinematics. So the true error for the marker based system is probably somewhere between the 0 0.35 and the one millimeter. And for x-rays, it can be all the way up to two millimeters in terms of translations. And this leads to the question that I want to address in this. So the question is, how sensitive are these estimated ligament properties from laxity tests due to this kinematic noise that will be there? And because we know that the ligament stiffness is relatively high and we have relatively large quotation mark for this application, uh, kinematic errors, the, the, the hypothesis was that it, it had a, a relatively large impact. If you want to know all of the details of the study, it has already been published. So it's published in Journal of Biomechanical Engineering, and you can follow this link down here or just search for the, the same title as the webcast, and then you can find the, the full detail of it. So the idea to I kind of um, get insights into this question, the first realization is that there's no way to make an experiment where we can isolate the noise because no matter what mechanical experiment we will do, we will have some kinematic noise. So eliminating the noise completely is not possible. So we're going to do it in a computational study as well, but we can fully remove the effect of the noise. So the idea was that we start up here with, with known ligament parameters. So we, we assume we know them to, to start with. And we use the parameters and one of the most common the used parameter sets in the literature, the so-called Blanke Ward paper. I'll come with a full reference in a bit. So we put in known ligament parameters into an e-model. And we created a lead, an e-model that had the four major ligaments. And then on this model, we then performed virtual laxity tests. So in the computer, performed laxity tests. And we did uh, several different once and there's actually four different sets and I'll, I'll describe them in detail. And then out of that, we get the ground truth laxity. So this is the laxity profile with no kinematic noise on it because we have done it computationally. So we know there's no, no noise of any sort of significance at this point. And then on that, we added random noise. So, and I, for this study, I, I kept it within plus minus half a millimeter for translation and half a degree plus minus um, and then repeated this many times with different noise levels I actually repeated it 20 times and then for each of them identified what are the ligament properties that come out of this so when we have added the noise we get this noisy target so a noisy laxity target and then from that we use the same procedure as usual to identify the ligament properties with optimization and then we get out an estimated ligament properties that we can then compare to what we put in. And then we repeated it 20 times per each of these laxity test sets um, to see what the effect is. Just a little bit about the model that we built. So this one was built on one female subject, was 27 years old at the time. And for her, we obtained detailed knee scans, MRIs in terms of the osteophritis initiative protocol. And we also obtained a full lower limb scan. And with this one, we only used to identify the hip joint centers and the ankle joint centers to be able to identify anatomical coordinate systems. And then out of the MRI scans, we then segmented the, the major structure. So we segmented the bones, uh, meniscus, cartilage, um, and all of the ligaments ligaments to identify the ligament insertions and then we created a new model and this model was created in the anybody modeling system and we assumed that the, the 
FEMO and TPA were rigid structures. We fixed FEMO to ground because this is normally the way you do the laxity test is that you somehow fixate the phi and then you manipulate TPA relative to FEMA. FEMA. Then we provided as input the knee flexion angle. Um, and this varied depending on the, the specific laxity test that we were doing. And associated with that, um, we, um, we also included a reaction moment because when you do the laxity test, you fixate the flexion angle and then you manipulate in the other five degrees of freedom. So to simulate that, we included a reaction moment on this knee uh, ankle fiber. Then the remaining five degrees of freedom in the tibiofemoral joint, we solved with our so-called force-dependent kinematics solver. Um, and the idea is that we, we solve for the remaining degrees of freedom by finding static equilibrium between all the applied loads. And when we have something that is fully static, this gives full static equilibrium. If you have something that includes dynamic movement, it will, it will give a quasi-static equilibrium. Then we included the major ligaments, so the four ligaments that I already described, and we used the parameters coming from this Blanke Ward paper from 1991. And we modeled the ligaments as a nonlinear elastic structure, which has a slack region, it has a nonlinear toe region, and then it's linear elastic at high strain, which is the most common model used. And then we modeled the contact between the femoral and tibial cartilage with an elastic foundation contact. So what you get out of this with the model like that is just to uh, just to try and illustrate it is that we have fixed the femur and then if we apply a load so this would be if we wanted to do a posterior laxity test then we apply the posterior loading and we have provided it's a full extension so this is also an input and then we compute what is the static equilibrium between all of the acting forces. So what, it, so what translation and rotation does TPA have to do in order for the, there to be equilibrium between the applied force, the contact force, and the ligament forces. And just to try and illustrate it, I have also done an image here where we are applying an anterior load. And it's a little difficult to see because the knee doesn't move that much. but one can see that this tibia bone here is a little bit further back than the one over here on the right. And one way to see it is that we look at the, at the PCL. You see PCL is kind of hidden here behind, up the, behind the cartilage, where it's over here, it's, it's a little bit visible. So tibia will move back and forth depending on, or rotate depending on what load we are applying with the given properties. So just a little bit about the force-dependent kinematics methods that, that we applied to solve this. If you want the full de detail of that, there's also a paper out which gives an introduction and all of the theory behind how, to, how it's used. And this is also published in Journal of Biomechanical Engineering in 2017. So the method can solve simultaneously for muscle forces, joint forces, ligament forces, and internal joint kinematics. And it combines inverse dynamic analysis with a quasi-static force equilibrium in the selected degrees of freedom. And it, what it does is that it runs an, an optimization loop around inverse dynamic analysis, where it has as input these degrees of freedom that we want to find. So in our knee model, these are everything but flexion extension. And then it associates with them a reaction force so that it can find out if I just move the knee in some direction, what is the applied external force that I need to do in order to keep equilibrium there? And then it moves the knee around until there's no need for an external force to be applied anymore, which means that the internal structures are in equilibrium. And this is what we use for computing the, the movement of the knee for every single load case that we are gonna look at. So the laxity tests that we then did for each of them, so I already mentioned that we did five set, uh, four sets, and just to give you a little insight of that. So on the first column, we have the loading direction. The second one, we have the magnitude of the load that we applied. And the third one is the knee flexion angle that we applied. In general, we included seven loading directions, being one being no load, one being anterior loading, one posterior loading, 
internal and external rotation loading and vowels valgus loading. In terms of the anterior and posterior loading, we have 134 newton and posteriorly is 67. And these were done at 30 degrees of flexion. And the same was the case for the no load situation. Internal and external rotation was two newton meters, and they were also done at 30 degrees of flexion. And then vowels valgus were done at full extension and 10 newton meters. This represents quite closely of what uh, a doctor would do when they are, of what they are aiming to do when they do it manually. And, and some of the more simplified tests are also replicating load cases in this range. So what we wanted to do as well was what happens to the ligament properties if I start including more loads? So is there any effect of that? Can I mitigate this kinematic noise error by introducing more load cases? So set number two, it's the seven, same seven loading directions. It's the same knee angles, but instead for all of the loads, there are two levels. So there's anterior loading and then there's one smaller and the same goes for all the other ones. So in set number two, there are two loading direction or two load magnitudes for each direction. Set number three is basically the same. The only thing is that we added so that they're not just at the 30 degrees and zero degrees, but all of them done at zero and 30 and with two loading magnitudes in all directions. And then set number four includes all again the same seven, but five magnitudes of loading for each of them and all of them at zero and 30 degrees of flexion. What did we find? So here's the major, major results. So we have the four ligaments. So if you look at the top row first, so we have the four ligament, ACL, PCL, MCL, LCL. And the top row here is the stiffness, which is in kilonewton per unit strain. Um, and the input that the, the parameters coming from the blanket board study is that for ACL, the stiffness is 10 kilonewton per unit strain, which is indicated with this gray square. For PCL, it's 18. Um, for MCL, it's 8.25, so it's a little bit here above eight. And then for LCA, it was six. And what did we then find? And we, so, and what you see are the, um, are the results for the 20 repetitions that we then ran the optimizer with different random noises. And what we find is that there are some outliers here. And we actually found ligament properties going from a little bit above eight all the way up to 13 with set number one, where we should have had 10 which is a large error compared to this uh, ligament, including more uh, laxity tests for set two and three, didn't really have a big effect on you know, the, the range that we found laxity uh, profiles or properties in. Um, however, set number four, which although includes 60 load cases, was actually able to keep the noise relatively small. Um, but that's probably practically infeasible to do 60 manual tests to uh, to keep the noise low. So we probably need another approach. And this story goes again for all of the other ligaments. It's a little bit um, it's a little bit different. Which of the which of the sets gives the largest error for which of the of the three sets where it doesn't manage to keep the error small? So if you take a set number three for PCL, we have a range from but it's this a little bit for, uh, 14 and a half all the way up to a, a bit above 22. And for MCL for set number one, we actually have an estimate all the way close to 16 and it should have been eight. So the errors are actually quite, actually quite large due to this uh, kinematic noise. And I should also say that this is probably an underestimation of the ranges because we only repeated it with 20 times, so 20 random samples. And to really represent the full range would probably require thousands or tens of thousands of uh, random samples, but that was infeasible to run all the optimization that's many times. So this is probably an underestimating of the ranges, but the errors are, are already varying the large, I think. The same story goes again for the reference strain, which is just another kind of representation of the slack length. Um, However, even here, if we take a look at set number four, it doesn't manage to keep the, 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 the range completely insignificant when you, uh, 
when you look even at set number four. I mean, it's not just one big dot as it is of, for the stiffnesses. There's some there's some variation here as well. Um, so just to um, conclude, so what we found is that small measurement noise has a large effect on estimated ligament properties. And only set number four with the 60 load cases was able to mitigate the error effect on the stiffness and it still left some residual effect on the reference strain. We have a couple of limitations of this study is that we only did it on one subject and we also only represented the, the ligament as one spring. And if we wanted to get closer to reality, we should probably divide it up into multiple spring elements. But this means that there are then many more parameters to find and we need even more laxity tests to find them. Also, the noise level that I included with the plus minus half a millimeter and half a degree is probably smaller than the, the noise in reality. As I already mentioned, Pedersen found up to two millimeters in terms of translation, one degree for rotations and about one millimeter, one degree has been reported for ISA. So if this is the application that we are thinking this into, we should probably repeat this thing with even larger noise um, magnitudes, which will then give even larger uh, error ranges. Um, and also, as I already mentioned, we probably underestimated the ranges because we only included 10 to, uh, 20 samples of random noise per set. And it would be, would be great to be able to repeat this with tens or thousands or tens of thousands of, of samples. But I, it's, it's going to take a long, long time to complete all those computations. Um, so just to conclude, so we found this sub-millimeter and sub-degree kinematic errors doing laxity measurements can have substantial effects on the estimated ligament properties. And therefore, we recommend that besides reporting estimated ligament properties, as has been done in, the, in, in many studies so far, we should establish methods to also estimate the associated uncertainty due to the measurement setup that was used to assess these so that we can also report error ranges or expected ranges where these ligament properties are in. And I think the implications of the results here are that the, the reported ligament properties that have been reported found using optimizations like this, they might actually be relatively inaccurate. That's all I had uh, planned to say. So um, thank you very much for your attention and I'm now happy to take your questions. I'll hand the screen back to uh, Christopher. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael, for the presentation. So just before we go to the Q&A session, I would like to say a few words regarding our online resources. So if you want to know more about Anybody Technology, you can go and check out our website, anybodytech.com, for events and special dates, and also a full publication list of studies using the Anybody Modeling System. You can also check out anyscript.org, which is our community website for people using anybody. And here you can find multiple online resources as our wiki page, several blog posts, and links to our repository sites. It's also here our forum is located and you are able to go here and ask questions and get help from some fellow anybody users. I would also like to point your attention to an upcoming webcast on the 6th of May, it holds the title, A Model-Based Methodology to Quantify the Sensitivity of Muscle, Ligament and Joint Compressive Forces to TPL Insert Thickness Variations after Total Knee Arthroplasty. So uh, the registration for this is online on our website already, or you can keep an eye on our social media sites and we'll post the registration there as well. I will also like to point your attention to uh, to uh, Alba University here in Denmark, who is planning to hold a, a new advanced musculoskeletal modeling PhD course. And the date are set to the 3rd of, to the 7th of May. And I think the deadline are coming up shortly. So uh, you think you need to hurry up and check this out if you want to attend it. And last but not least, if you have any questions or you want to meet up or you are interested in trying out the trial version of our software, then please feel free to send us an email at sales at anybodytech.com. And if you have any follow-up questions with, uh, which we don't get to answer at this Q&A session regarding this webcast, then please feel free to send me an email at ki at anybodytech.com. 